Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final webinar in a three-part series focused on the important role of early literacy in equity-driven teaching and learning. My name is Claire Abbott, and I'm the Director of the Office of Educator Effectiveness here at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in Massachusetts. So here at DESE, we are committed to supporting the preparation, development, and celebration of teachers and leaders who make a difference for the one million students in our schools. Ensuring that all students learn how to read, to write, and to engage with one another and with the world is central to this work and fundamental to our commitment to equity. Not just equitable access to evidence-based teaching and learning, but equitable outcomes for all. And this includes our multilingual students. In Massachusetts, over 100,000 students, or close to 12%, are classified as English language learners. And these numbers are growing. At DESE, we are working hard to ensure that all multilingual students are taught by effective, well-prepared, and culturally responsive educators to advance students' academic and linguistic development simultaneously. Preparation and development in effective, evidence-based early literacy instruction that builds upon these students' funds of knowledge and is tailored to the specific needs of the student is essential to this work. You can read more about this statewide mass literacy initiative, as well as the Massachusetts Blueprint for English Learner Success on our website, the links to which we will drop into the chat, as well as new expectations for early literacy instruction in teacher preparation programs that will go into effect in 2024. Momentarily, I will turn it over to our amazing panel of national experts and literacy leaders from K-12 and educator preparation schools to dive into this topic. We are deeply honored and grateful to them for dedicating their time and expertise today. But first, I want to thank the Hunt Institute for their partnership in developing these webinars, each of which is being recorded and published on our website. And I want to encourage participants to listen to the conversation as it unfolds and to share questions for our panelists using the Q&A feature of the Zoom platform. We will reserve time toward the end of this discussion to raise some of the questions for our panelists. And while we may not get to every question, uh, we do our best to elevate as many as we can. And now I am honored to introduce the moderator for today's conversation, Dr. Claudia Rinaldi. Dr. Rinaldi is a professor of education and chair of the education program at LaSalle University in Newton, Massachusetts. A renowned national expert on learning disabilities of English language learners, and the implementation of response to intervention and the multi-tier system of support with a focus on supporting English language learners, Dr. Rinaldi's research focuses on how to improve systems and instructional practices for students with reading difficulties who may be at risk for failure or those who are English language learners and who may have mild and moderate disabilities. She sits on numerous national and statewide advisory groups and is regularly featured in online platforms panels and webinars in Spanish, addressing issues about English language learners and their struggles in schools with a focus on strategies for parents and teachers. Welcome, Dr. Rinaldi, and thank you so much for leading this important conversation. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Claire, for this wonderful welcome and to you and to the Hunt Institute for organizing uh, this amazing opportunity for our educators, parents, and community, community members who may be listening in today. Um, like you said, I, have, I was amazed by the growing number of over 100,000 English learners, or multilingual learners who are in our schools today, um, particularly in Massachusetts, but of course this growing trend is nationwide. So I'm sure we have people from outside our state here today. And I, I, I'm really um, inspired by the opportunity to hear from our speakers today uh, who bring a wealth of knowledge from research and practice and application uh, all to kind of merge together to provide us with some ideas, uh, evidence-based practices, research-based practices, um, so that we can apply them in our classroom. Um, one of the, th the areas that I wanted to kind of address was that the merge between the teacher preparation programs and teacher education in our, in our schools. And, you know, I'm hoping that tonight, um, today, this, this conversation gives administrators also an opportunity to capitalize on partnerships between university teacher education programs and our schools' professional development units. 
I know we all strive to kind of come in and work together and we all need to do a little bit better on that to be more genuine partnerships that really build upon each other's expertise. I know in working with close um, districts that we work closely with at my institution, I've seen the growth of what can happen where we're, when we are true partners and not just drop in professional development. We really are able to uh, help teachers, help administrators understand the variety of needs that our English learners and multilingual learners bring to our communities, to our schools. And we are able to plan for them for the long term, which is really something that I feel we need. I began my career in education as a fifth grader coming in from Bogota, Colombia in South America. So I was an English learner myself. And so this area is really close to my heart and it brought up a responsibility when I finished my teacher preparation program myself in Miami, Florida. It made me realize that we have to do better for all our kids and we have to pass it forward to them. So with that, I'd love to introduce our three speakers today. Um, Dr. Glad uh, Claude Goldenberg. He is the Nomellini and Olivier Professor of Education Emeritus at the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University, a native of Argentina, so close to my area. His area of research and professional interest centers on promoting academic achievement among language minority children and youth. Prior to his arrival at Stanford, Goldenberg was Professor of Teacher Education, Associate Dean of the College of Education, and Executive Director of the Center for Language Minority Education and Research at California State University in Long Beach. Dr. Goldenberg was also on the National Research Council's Committee on the Prevention of Early, Early Reading Difficulties in Young Children and on the National Literacy Panel, which synthesized research on literacy development among language minority children and youth. I am very excited, but he has to tell us today. Dr. Christina Budi is an assistant professor specializing in language and literacy education in the School of Education at the University of Delaware. She began her career teaching elementary students and ESL. Her passion in teaching language and literacy and supporting students with socio-emotional growth is echoed in her research where she seeks to understand the classroom practices and context that build upon the culturally and linguistically diversity of students, as well as promote socio-emotional well-being, an area very needed during this time after COVID. Accordingly, her research focuses on the language and literacy development and instruction in early childhood and elementary age children from diverse backgrounds. She teaches courses at the, her university related to literacy instruction and teaching multilingual learners. We're so excited to hear from her. And finally, we have Mandy Hollister, who's an ESL teacher, instructional coach, and coordinator of App Academy Holland, an elementary school serving students in grades K through five, uh, K one through five in Dorchester, Massachusetts. She has worked um, with students learning English as an additional and foreign language ranging in ages from kindergarten to adults. Ms. Hollister is a graduate of Fresno State University in California, where she grew up. She later then moved to Spain to teach English abroad and has since settled in Boston after completing her degree in ESL at Simmons College. She's an avid consumer of all things literacy and an advocate for multilingual learners access to high quality grade level content. We are so excited that you're here. So if it's okay with you, we'll go ahead and begin with our first question. Dr. Uh, Dr. Goldenberg, the national conversation about literacy instruction, particularly literacy instruction for multilingual learners can sometimes feel very divisive and reminiscent of the reading wars of the past. This can make it difficult to discuss this important topic uniquely for this population how to teach reading and writing in multiling for, with multilingual learners. Recognizing the complexity and nuance of learning to read, particularly in a language you're simultaneously learning. Are there some universal understandings about language and literacy development that all teachers should know and understand? Yes, thank you for this question, Claudia. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you to you, to Claire, to the Hunt Institute for setting this up. I'm thrilled and honored to be here, and I'm looking forward to the conversation as well. Um, yes, in fact, there are some universals. Uh, I'm going to name five. I'm going to try to do each one in one minute, since I've been allotted five of those. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you the punchline at the beginning, because I want you to think about these, knowing what the punchline is. And the punchline is that all of these apply 
to English learners. I'm not going to say anything about English learners specifically because that's what our conversation is going to be about, but all of these apply to English learners with some additional considerations and um, supports, which we'll get into. So here are the five. The first one is that written language and oral language are different. They are different things. They're both language, but they're taken in and they're processed by the brain differently. We're born knowing how to take in and start making sense of oral language. Certainly in the case of, the, of our first oral language, you know, absent uh, a developmental delay or some sort of anomaly, we intrinsically know how to make sense of human speech. We intrinsically know that it's meaningful. And from the get-go, we try to make sense of it. You know, it's part of our DNA. It's part of our human evolution. We're born with the brain wiring already in place that is essential for making sense of human speech, otherwise known as oral language. Now, written language is different. It is literally a human invention that appeared roughly 5,000 years ago in contrast to human speech, which appeared roughly 300,000 years ago. As you know, there's no written record, but the best anthropological and archeological research that we have suggested human speech evolved about 300,000 years ago, whereas written language, print, evolved much more recently. So we're not born knowing how to process print in order to make it meaningful. The brain circuitry literally has to be constructed that allows us to process, take in and produce written language, right? So that's number one. And as a result, or the fact that written language and oral language are different, comes number two, that we have to be taught how to process, how to make sense of written language. Some individuals learn very quickly. I mean, seemingly effortlessly, as if it were natural, but it's not natural because we've got to learn something that we're not born knowing how to process. For others, it's much more difficult, much more difficult. And the rest of us are somewhere in between. The range is enormous, but if we want to increase the likelihood that everyone learns to read and to write, to become literate, we need to make sure that everyone has the experiences, including the instruction, that's required to turn print and, print and text into comprehensible, meaningful language. That's the challenge that we face, turning print into comprehensible, meaningful language. Until then, it's just marks on a page, which then leads to my third point, which is that in order to be able to read and write, you need to have the requisite foundational skills. And by this, I mean the understanding that the sounds of human speech, what spoken words are literally made up of, sometimes called phonemes. And by the way, I just want to tell the audience that, I mean, I'm giving a lot of information. I'm happy to make this, you know, write this up and send it out to you. So I would suggest you just try to listen and process and don't try to write down everything because it's kind of dense, but I'm happy to send this out as a text to anyone who wants it. So in order to be able to read and write, you have to have the foundational skills. And, and what I mean by that is the understanding that the sounds of human speech, right? What makes up letters and makes up words, sometimes called phonemes, that these phonemes are represented by letters and groups of letters. Now that's true for all languages, even the ones that are non-alphabetic. You still have to connect the sounds of the spoken language to the written representations. I mean, that is non-negotiable. If you can't make that connection, you cannot learn to read and write. You need to have the understanding and the skills to go from speech to print, in the words of Louisa Motes, that some of you might be familiar with, and from print to speech. But just knowing this is not enough, which leads to number four, which is you need to be able to turn print into meaningful language quickly and automatically. In Mark Seidenberg's phrase, language at the speed of sight. Right? We understand oral language intrinsically as it's coming in. First couple of years are spent kind of sorting out the sounds and distinguishing one phoneme for another and making sense of words because it's highly contextualized. But in order to be fully literate, you have to be able to turn lang written language into language at the speed of sight. And the best way to do this is to teach foundational skills directly, explicitly, and systematically. 
striving for accuracy and automaticity. And then as reading, as you start reading phrases and sentences and longer patches of text, you have to become fluent, meaning accurately, automatically, and with appropriate inflection and intonation. Sometimes it's called prosody. And then finally, number five, but by no means least important, full literacy requires much more than automatic and accurate foundational skills. You need vocabulary and other aspects of language development, background knowledge, comprehension skills. You need motivation to keep barreling through. All of these are critically important. And they can't wait until the foundational skills are seated and in place. You have to start building this other part of the literacy apparatus that involves vocabulary and language and comprehension, comprehension skills and motivation. You have to start building this part of the apparatus from the get-go, even before kids attend school. Read alouds, content lessons, conversations, field trips, if you're lucky. If not, at least media and other kind of direct experiences. But they have to be primarily oral or visual because until individuals have enough literacy skills, their language and background knowledge and vocabulary and so forth can't benefit from just from reading it themselves. So you have to read it to them and provide the kind of experiences that are necessary that eventually will sort of hook up with the foundational skills and lead to full literacy. And sometimes, you know, you hear the disparagement about science of reading or whatever that people are obsessed with. You got to decode first, and then you can worry about language and comprehension. That is untrue. Mo both must be developed from the beginning using different channels and using different techniques that I suspect we'll get into, but you cannot put off vocabulary, the meaning part, the communicative part, the reading we, the reason we read and write. You can't put those off until kids can decode. I mean, that, that's just nonsense. And anyone who advocates that really doesn't understand the research. So all of those things are important. All of those things are, in my estimation, universal, including for English learners. But we make special provisions for English learners because they're simultaneously learning the language as they're learning to read and write it. Now, Mandy and Christine and Claudia might have somewhat different perspectives on this, which is fine. I'm looking forward to hearing their thoughts about it and engaging in some good conversation. So thank you again for having this, this great episode. Thank you, Dr. Goldenberg. That was so um, on key, uh, research-based and evidence-based, right? I, those key terms are ones that we should be engaging in and looking at what research is telling us. I think you really hit on two areas, the vocabulary and the oral language, um, which result in active engagement in classrooms. And I think that's exactly what you're saying with experiences. Um, and that's exactly what universal design for learning is encouraging is that active learning that can happen in the classrooms. So thinking about this is how do we prepare our teachers that are gonna be our pre-service teachers that are gonna be going to be going out to our classrooms and our in-service teachers. So I'll move my question to Dr. Christina Rudy. Every multilingual learner the same deserves the same opportunities as their monolingual English speakers peers to engage in high quality curriculum and grade level content. Can you elevate some of the instructional practices or micro practices and strategies that have the greatest impact on students? And what do pre-service teachers need to learn in relation to those practices? Thank you, Claudia, for the question. And thanks, um, Desi and the Hunts Institute for inviting me to speak today. So to prepare for this panel, I wanted to think deeply but concisely about what does the research say and a lot of what Claude just discussed and what we know to be effective instruction for multilingual learners in the early and elementary grades. And there's so much to share, but for the next five minutes, I wanted to narrow it down to my top four instructional practices. So what is going to give you the biggest bang for your buck, so to speak, when it comes to educating your multilingual learners? My first practice is that teachers can leverage the curriculum that they have or high quality instructional materials, materials that they're required to use that we know are not necessarily designed to support multilingual learners to facilitate those foundational literacy skills that Claude talked about. But we can use those materials while addressing specific academic and linguistic needs of our multilingual learners. So for example, we know that uh, phonological awareness and word loving level decoding are important for all of our students. Um, but we know 
For multilingual learners, typically we need more and additional support in language comprehension. So as teachers are starting to think about, okay, what does language comprehension look like in your classroom? It might be useful to ask yourself to be successful with the content, what do students need to know and do with language across three levels at the word level, the sentence level and the discourse level. And then you think about providing explicit instruction and scaffolding supports for your students. So for example, if I know in a less in my lesson for my first graders, they are going to need to be able to identify character traits for a main character and provide evidence from the text um, that we've been reading to support their ideas. Depending on their English language development at this very moment in time, I might need to focus on teaching discourse connectors. So they're linking the character traits with evidence from the text using the word because. And I might do this by teaching and using language frames that provide more and then provide more or less support with those language frames to my students, depending on their needs. Second, Teachers need to be able to not only assess content learning, but language learning, and they use that data to then plan and modify their instruction. So as teachers, how do you know what to assess? That's where the practice of writing and sharing a language objective can come into play. So teachers are really good at writing and planning content objectives, but when educators also intentionally think about what is the language that the child needs to access the content, you know, maybe that's working with past tense verbs at the sentence level or specific vocabulary at the word level. Educators can assess students' progress towards meeting those language objectives and then use that data to determine if the supports have been in place and are working or not. So in this case, teachers will use data to drive instruction. So not only focusing on content, but also on the language that students need. Third, teachers have to provide multiple opportunities for interaction and language practice for multilingual learners to engage in language. So I love Leo von Leer used this term language as action. And I love that term because it reminds teacher that is teachers that language is something that we do um, through group work, authentic projects, interactive activities that span across modes of communication, listening, speaking, viewing, representing, writing. Um, so it might include simply asking students to turn and talk and practice speaking their thoughts and ideas in a very low stakes situation before sharing with the whole class, um, which can feel more intimidating sometimes. To, all, to a more complex um, sort of engagement where students are engaged in inquiry and project-based learning. And fourth, that leads me to my fourth recommendation, Teachers can intentionally structure the learning environment to support language learning, which includes recognizing the child or the student as a whole person, not just an English learner. So that means nurturing students' bilingualism and biculturalism. And teachers have to learn about their students and then bring those learnings or findings into the classroom. So this might look like asking students to share their language and culture, inviting family members in to um, record or inviting family members to record themselves, reading a book in the home language, singing a song, putting it in the listening center for all students to access, um, or even letting students present their work, sharing projects in English, the home language, or a combination of both, letting students share their expertise. And additionally, I've been looking a lot at cross-linguistic transfer and how students, um, excuse me, and how teachers can leverage what a student knows in the home language. Um, and opportunities for interaction using the home language can be as simple as a think pair share. It could be an activity that you base on students' individualized needs and their ELP level. And the more you allow students to engage authentically speaking with their peers using their home language or a combination of the home language and English, the more students can gain confidence and build proficiency in both languages and the grade level content as well. And then just to wrap up, thinking about the second half of your question, Claudia, what do we need to do for pre-service teachers? How can we support pre-service teachers? Well, pre-service teachers benefit from the explicit instruction of these practices as well through discussion, observation, whether that's by video or in the classroom, and then practicing enactment of how to scaffold these practices in classes and out in the field. But to be truly successful in understanding the language demands of a classroom, it, um, it often involves providing pre-service teachers with access to 
to functional linguistics in, additional to the, in addition to the pedagogy. So over the past few years, I've heard comments from my students um, like, Dr. Buddy, counting phonemes is really hard or identifying morphemes is very challenging. So I can't expect my pre-service teachers to teach morphological awareness if they don't know how to analyze a word first by identifying, identifying those morphemes. So in teacher education, language practice is important, if not equally as important as the pedagogy. And I think this is so critical that I'm actually working now to design a new course for my students that's going to be focused on the structure of language for teachers. So I'm gonna wrap up there because I know Mandy has a lot of valuable practice and application that she's gonna be able to share with us as well. Thank you, Dr. Woody. That was incredible. Um, I love what you identified as um, the teachers being able to assess content and language, um, because I think oftentimes we get stuck on the content and kind of leave the language to the ESL teacher. But every teacher has to be involved in the process of evaluating the progress that the child is making in English um, and how they're maybe transferring from that native language to English. Um, and that made me think about, you know, that it is important for teachers to think that there is no average child. And in fact, we should automatically think about that there's about 20% of kids that are gonna need some additional support, whether they have a disability, whether they're multilingual learners, any of those children, about 20%. So if you come into your classroom thinking, okay, about who are my 20% that are gonna need a tiered instructional support? Um, then we can think about those very specific experiences and that specific strategy of looking at morphemes or explicit instruction, experiential learning, uh, cross language transfer so that we're able to, to help them along. And I also love your point on translanguage, uh, translanguaging, the cross linguistic uh, transfer of languages and engaging them at home because I think oftentimes we also hear, you know, teachers telling parents, please speak to them in English. And actually that delays our students in learning English. But what it keeps them from growing is exactly what Dr. Goldenberg and you said, which is vocabulary, experiences. Experiences build vocabulary, which builds more vocabulary in any language. And then the transfer back to English is very rich. So thank you for those points. I'll move my next question to Ms. Hollister. Um, often uh, people hear uh, and we heard from Dr. Goldenberg, systemic, explicit, and direct instruction, and picture rigid, uh, unengaging lessons focused on remote memorization. What have you learned in your time in the classroom about engaging uh, and joyful instruction of fundamental literacy skills for multilingual learners that you wish you had known on day one as a teacher? Thank you, Claudia. So this is kind of a tricky topic and a touchy subject for a lot of people, this idea that literacy instruction has to be joyful for our students or that all of our students are actually going to end up learning to love reading. If you want to hear more about that, Pamela Snow just did an amazing podcast on Melissa and Lori Love Literacy, where she does talk about that. But for me, what I found to be the most important thing in my foundational literacy instruction is the engagement of the students with the teacher doing the least amount of work and the students doing the most work. Um, we like to talk about this in my school as having the most at bats with the skill that we're targeting. Um, you know, as a teacher on day one, I wish I would have known how to merge um, what I knew about language acquisition with um, instruction in general, especially because I didn't know anything about reading instruction. I suppose I did have some coursework on it, but it was really a tricky thing for me to try to learn. And so through a lot of um, self-study, I've learned to successfully plan a targeted reading lesson that's both systematic, um, explicit, and developed language instruction in a way that's fun. You know, Dr. Anita Archer, she's like super famous for her archerisms, but she always talks about how success breeds motivation. And this is absolutely true in when we're thinking specifically right now about phonics instruction. The teachers at our school are required as part of their ELD instruction to also pull and do um, foundational reading instruction with our English language learners. And in that 15 to 20 minutes of um, group time, right, it's really important for them to make sure that our students have as many at-bats with the, the, the targeted skill. 
Additionally, when our multilingual learners feel heard and their language is validated, they're motivated to keep learning, right? Um, for our multilingual learners, we also have to create a space in our group to slow down. I'm telling my teachers this all the time. You don't have to do as many words in your like chaining activity, but slow down and actually take the time to talk about the words that they're studying. These are a random set of words that we're choosing to focus on a specific phonic skill. And we have to create the safe space for our students to be able to talk about the words that they're being asked to spell and read, right? So for example, if we're studying, um, you know, the consonant cluster ST ending, right? And we're using words in a word list like lost or missed or nest or chest, right? Our first grade students are, who are studying birds right now, I might stop and ask them, um, slow down in this moment and talk about those words first, explain their meaning of these words. Um, and then have them orally produce their own story using these words. So for example, they might say something like a bird became lost trying to find their way back to their nest for whatever reason, because it's a mist, right? Um, and so on and so forth. This opens up also for a discussion about story elements um, as well. And what kid doesn't love making their own stories up? <laughs> Um, also, Elsa Cardenas Hagan, she talks a lot, especially about these words that are used in the CVC decodable time period, like especially for kindergartner kids um, learning to read these words like jam or cap or something like that, that have so many multiple meanings, right? Taking the time to slow down and um, really expose the full range of meanings for these, like I can be in a jam. Um, I can be stuck in a traffic jam. I can put jam on a sandwich, but I can also go on Saturday with my guitar to a jam session. So in my coaching and in my own practice, I'm constantly pushing my teachers to connect the meaning of the words that they are targeting in their skills. If we're spending time um, teaching students to decode and spell words without connecting to the meaning, it's just a useless time. Um, you know, we're right now in the middle of our year, we just did our progress monitoring for middle of the year, and we're seeing a gap and this is typical for you know reading comes along faster than spelling usually but especially for our multilingual learners. My suspicion is that we're spending more time um, teaching words teaching kids to spell words that they haven't necessarily connected the meaning to. Um, so when we think about engaging and joyful literacy instruction for multilingual learners, there's nothing that kills joy faster than being unsuccessful. Um, so I think it is necessary to teach those foundational reading skills explicitly and systematically, but it can definitely still be engaging and joyful and creating a space for students to practice um, the targeted phonics skills while also acquiring their language skills. Thank you, Ms. Hollister. That was um, really insightful. Um, and I love the idea of slowing down. I know we're in a competition for the scope and sequence, but it's the scope and sequence and learn nothing or is to slow down and really learn and increase vocabulary and those skills that they need to, that the children need to learn. I also think you highlighted on something unique, which is when you slow down, you could build relationship around the student and the content. So relationship building, getting to really know them, understand where they came from, know how they're using their, their first language to mediate the learning and the second language. It's only doable if we are slowing down and building relationship. Um, another aspect that it made me um, think about was, you know, exactly what Dr. Goldenberg um, talked about in the beginning, which the five areas of literacy are critical, but oral language is the sixth one. And we don't talk enough about that in general education about, you know, sixth area of, lang of literacy instruction is oral language development. And that oral language development is what helps us to learn language. That's how you learn as a baby to communicate. So, you know, using that in our classrooms through that relationship building and slowing down to deal with the vocabulary and apply it um, is an excellent strategy that you helped us to think through as uh, teachers are thinking about today or as our pre-service educators and thinking about on how to build in their lesson plans and in their practicum. So thank you for that, Ms. Hollister. 
Um, I'm going to move on to our next questions. Um, the, the next two questions will be open to any of you, so please feel free to jump in. Um, and the first question uh, really deals with, you know, many men multilingual students in the Commonwealth being taught in what we call SEI or sheltered English immersion classrooms where the instruction is in English with ESL supports, but the general education teacher is supposed to be applying um, strategies to shelter the English. How can educators in these classrooms leverage the linguistic and cultural assets of multilingual learners to enhance early literacy instruction? How can educator preparation programs prepare teacher candidates to do the same, to teach literacy to the linguistically diverse population of students that they're gonna have in their classrooms? So I'm wondering if either, any of you have any thoughts. Can I nominate Christina to uh, take the lead on here? Sorry, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I think you've already addressed some of it in your comments. Mm -hmm. and I, maybe you could elaborate a bit now. Sure. Yeah. So I think it's it's so important for us to remember that multilingual learners bring with them a wealth of linguistic and cultural assets. And educators can really leverage those assets to enhance early literacy instruction. And as I've talked about, or as I mentioned before, uh, one effective ap approach is to incorporate the students' home languages and cultures into the classroom and then use these resources to build on their existing knowledge and skills. So like everyone's talked about really bringing thinking about the experiences that students bring in and know in their first language. Um, and to be able to do this, research shows us that teachers need to know their learners. And that sounds so simple, right? Many educators do know their learners in terms of how they perform in their classroom in English. But when I say know your learners, I'm also talking about learning about multilingual learners' language backgrounds, their experiences, and their proficiencies in both languages. So teachers are able to develop even or dig even deeper into students' lives. Um, and in order to do that, thinking specifically about our pre-service teachers, um, we need to provide strategies. How do you learn about your students, um, which depending on their, their, EL, their English language proficiency level, that might look different. So a teacher may have to think about asking students more about themselves by using visuals to illustrate their experiences or having them write about their experiences in their home language and then finding someone to translate or meeting with family members or identifying a bilingual community member um, who can serve as a guide or a liaison to the child's family and community. So really thinking about, as an educator, how can I leverage what my students know and how do I get that information? Like what strategies or techniques can I use to find out what they do know and what they bring to the classroom? Can I build on that? Because that's such an interesting point. You know, yeah. you know, we say build on what students know, but sometimes it's hard to find that out. Um, yeah. one, of the, one of the techniques for doing that is, is listening. And, and teachers typically are not that great at listening, right? Because when it's silent, they, you know, we get nervous or we start talking and, and kind of crowd out other dots. I, I just want to tell you about a, a, uh, an instance. Years ago, I was working on this interactive discussion model that I've worked on with some teacher colleagues and others called Instructional Conversation. And um, it's a way of just kind of, it's a template for kind of guiding discussion, conversation on a little deeper level. So you kind of get into complex concepts. So this kindergarten teacher I was working with, and this was, these were all English learners, Spanish speakers, and she was a Spanish speaker. She was from Costa Rica. So the Spanish per se was not an issue. So she wanted to do an instructional conversation. Some, the theme was somewhere along, along the lines of the grass is always greener, et cetera. So she was going to use the book, The Country Mouse and the City Mouse, uh, in Spanish, of course. So she began the instructional conversation by kind of, you know, um, reading recovery has this phrase, uh, roaming around the known, right? We try to figure out what kids know about something, which is a good concept. So she asked kids, well, what do you know about, and this is all in Spanish, uh, what do you know about, um, about uh, being in the country? And she called it uh, El Campo. ¿Qué, ¿Qué saben del campo? ¿Qué pasa en el campo? And the kids looked at her like, you know, she'd sprouted a second head or something. They had no idea what she was talking about. But she had the foresight to come armed with a group of pictures to illustrate. And so she'd hold up these pictures, you know, tractors and horses, you know, the usual. And one kid said, oh, maestra, you mean el rancho. 
Yeah, rancho, right. So as soon as the word rancho came in, came out, you, you couldn't shut these kids up. And you had to find, they knew, they knew things about El Campo, but they knew it as rancho. So you had to really work at trying to figure out what they knew that you could draw out and build upon. And then she, you know, had a very successful conversation. But even if you know the language, it can still be hard to kind of figure out what kids know that's relevant to whatever you want to move them on to next. And I, I always think of that as a classic example of you got to work at it. I would just add, I co-sign everything Dr. Buddy and Dr. Goldenberg have mentioned, but just um, this idea that in, you know, we're in Massachusetts, we are a WIDA state. And at the beginning of the year, we get our class list. I'm not a homeroom teacher, but I have the ESL teacher hand out, you know, a list of who their English learners are in their classroom. And, you know, you can look at a, num a level three and think what I learned in ed prep is a level three, but the range of level mm. three is so broad that, you know, some, that was kind of a surprise for me because I learned the levels, all the WIDA levels, but, right. you know, really dig deep. And like a one doesn't always mean a one as a newcomer, a one could indicate the student has been here since kindergarten, but for whatever reason hasn't acquired reading and they're still marked as a level one on your roster right now. So this plays back into Claudia, what you were saying about really getting to know your students. Um, I think in prep programs, it's essential to, yes, you know, hand out the WIDA level descriptors and talk about what those ranges mean, but also, you know, that you could get a level three who is a true, like, newcomer has been here for one or two years and has now reached a level three, you know, a typical level three level, or there's the level three long-term English learners who have been in our schools for several years and are still having trouble exiting on the access test. So that's my two cents for that piece or that question. Thank you, Mandy. And I think you you really landed on something that uh, really spoke to me. I visited a couple schools a year ago and I saw a sixth grader that was a level three in special education. And when we look back at his WIDA scores, they went from a six in third grade to a 1.8 in sixth grade. And, you know, what that tells me is, you know, engagement. So how engaged is he with the content? What kind of relationship does he have around learning and home and culture? And how are they connecting that to instruction? So I think you hit it right on, you know, all level threes are not the same. And we should be getting to really deeply know them. And what we do know is they tend to stay in the back of the classroom and teachers tend to call on the kids that know the answers. So in teacher preparation, I always have them go in and observe classrooms and say, who is the teacher calling? You wanna know who's the calling because we tend to do this just by nature of you know, teaching. So we, if we know it, we're able to change it. And calling the students may be a little bit harder, prepare them to answer, but really that results in engagement and in relationship building. So I think you hit on something really important. Um, I have another question that we could go in. This would be our last question before we open it to our, our guests uh, today if, to see if they have any questions coming in. And I know that the Claire is, Claire is following up on those. So the question goes as, as such. In, first and sec in the first and second webinars of this series, the panelists acknowledge that in order to see real and lasting ch systems change and literacy instruction, we first have to acknowledge and remove the barriers to successfully adopting culturally and linguistically sustaining evidence-based practices. For example, for example, John Ho Jen Hogan named initiative overload as a potential barrier to adopting evidence-based practices. And Ashley Clergy highlighted the need for sustained teacher training and intellectual preparation for lessons through a cultural lens. What are some specific barriers we need to remove in order to ensure effective literacy instruction for multilingual learners from today's conversation? I'll volunteer since Mandy and Christina are on mute. <laughs> Thanks, Claude. <laughs> I take these nonverbal signals seriously, you know. Um, I'll, I'll go next, Claude. Don't worry. Okay, <laughs> okay you got my back. Um, 
yeah, this is a this is a good question. Uh, and I actually want to identify three barriers. I, I tend to enumerate things you might have noticed. Um, the, the first barrier is that it, it, it's more complicated. I mean, there's no question. It's more challenging for students and for teachers to teach literacy in a language you're simultaneously learning to speak and understand. I mean, it's just harder. There's just no getting around it. Um, and and that, that's a barrier. It's a barrier that we have to overcome, but, it, but, but we have to acknowledge that and not just sort of kind of take for granted, oh, yeah, yeah, you do these things and you know, teachers need a lot more support than, than are being provided and, and students do as well. So that's one barrier. Another barrier is that there's a lot of confusion around terms. Now we could spend, you already had a, a webinar on culturally responsive uh, pedagogy and so forth. So I don't wanna go down that track, but culturally responsive pedagogy is, is actually, I think something far more complicated and in some ways more problematic than people realize. Personally, no one's asked me, but I'm going to tell you anyway, I think a better term than culturally responsive is responsive to the lived experience of the individual, because we tend to think of culture in rather superficial terms, quinceaneras, uh, soccer instead of baseball. So, okay, those all count in the lived experience, but not if you haven't experienced them. You know, if you've never done a piñata, then even though it's part of your Mexican culture, it's not really that meaningful. And so people use culturally responsive as sort of a gloss, a very superficial gloss, when I think what, 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 what really is involved is tapping into the lived experience of students, of children. And I know like when I was teaching first grade, one of the things that I had my students do was write letters, give them a homework assignment to write a letter to your grandmother. Because I knew for a fact that their parents, this is before, the internet and email and texting and so forth, but there's still opportunities to use text with email and to write to your grand grandparents. I mean, that is culturally, there's nothing inherently cultural about writing a letter, the Mexican, El Salvadorian, Hmong, Vietnamese culture, but it's part of their culture because it's part of their lived experience, right? Same thing with tarea, the, the, the word in Spanish for homework. That's very culturally relevant because parents know exactly what that means something the teacher is sending home that you're expected to do, finish and bring back to school. Well, there's nothing inherently Vietnamese or Chinese or El Salvadorian about that, but it's the lived experience of the parents and the children. So when we talk about culturally responsive, I always recommend that you think operationally in terms of connecting with the lived experience of, of children and of, of families. And we use, confuse, there are other confusing terms like balanced literacy. You know, balanced literacy, really, I hate to sound mean, but it's been the term balanced literacy has been perverted and hijacked by a very wrong-headed theory of how to teach literacy, otherwise known as whole language, three queuing, they're different terms. Balanced literacy was actually used by the National Reading Panel to suggest what we've been suggesting, which is you need foundational skills, but as part of a comprehensive program, you also do things like read-alouds, vocabulary, experiential learning, that's balanced literacy, not looking randomly at pictures, letters, context, syntax as a form of word recognition. The notion of three queuing and balanced literacy as a, as a way of word recognition is a terrible idea, but the notion of balanced literacy is focusing on foundational skills, focusing on language, meaning, and communication, not necessarily at the same time, but eventually converging them. That is what balanced literacy should be. And other terms have been sort of hijacked. And the last one, and I promise I'll be quiet, I very, I worry very much, and anyone who cares about literacy education should worry about a lot of disinformation that's being put out there. A lot of disinformation. If I've heard it once, I've heard it a dozen times, things like science of reading is an English-centric program. Now, that is not even wrong. It's so preposterous. Science of reading is not a program, for starters. And secondly, there's a worldwide literature in multiple languages, first and second languages, that counts as the science of reading. It's part of the literacy knowledge base. That is a piece of disinformation that if I had one wish in this space, I could just squash because it's doing a tremendous amount of harm to students and teachers for this myth to be propagated. 
And I can give you other examples, but the idea is there's so much misinformation, disinformation, and outright falsehood floating around that that is a tremendous barrier to doing what I think all of us in this panel are, would like to accomplish. I agree, Claude, thank you. I would just build on that general idea um, to kind of take it down to the school level. Some of the biggest barriers here, even at my school, which I think we have like ironed out a lot of kinks over the years, but um, I've kind of went through and thought about like scheduling, not even just like on the teacher level scheduling, but like we have guidance within Massachusetts about how many ESL minutes um, students are supposed to receive. And, you know, the ESL teacher is supposed to be working in concert with the homeroom teachers and scheduling for teachers to be able to meet and collaborate is a huge barrier. Um, you know, we often run into like conflicting priorities where the homeroom teacher doesn't want you to take the ESL student right now because they need to do this or, you know, it can be a barrier, right, to get everybody on the same page and aligned. And, you know, we're talking about systematic and explicit, right? If I'm working on one thing and the homeroom teacher is working on another thing, and when they go to MTSS, they're working on another thing. And, you know, it can get kind of messy. And these are definite barriers within the school level. Thank you, Mandy. Um, and I, I think. Uh, Dr. Bodhi, if you have something else to add, oh, we have two questions too that I think are wonderful. So I want to respond to our to our audience. Sure, sure. I'll be very quick. I just wanted to add, when we think about another barrier that we hear a lot or we think of a lot is that it always feels like this is adding something else, that providing support for multilingual learners is one more thing I have to do. And I really want help to help teachers realize or to think about that providing supports for your multilingual learners isn't something extra, but it's, it's an enhanced way of teaching. So it's like when you take a photograph on your phone and you can click on the, the picture and you can click on the little app that says enhancement and all of a sudden your photograph is brighter and clearer and easier to see. Um, it's kind of like, it makes me think about that. When you take the content and you look at the content and you apply the enhancement feature, you're really thinking about the language demands of the content that you're already teaching. And then what supports can you put in place for your students? So I really like to think about that these supports that Claude and Mandy and I have talked about today, it's not extra, it's an enhancement to what we're already doing. Thank you for that. I love the idea enhancement and I could just see it tied so closely to universal design for learning because it gives you those enhancements already to, so that you don't even have to think about them. So if you have not explored that, I really urge you to do that. Uh, we have two questions that I'd like to, to address as well. Um, but I'd like to begin by saying that one of you said that the students have a lot to say. And I agree with, um, I think Mandy, it might've been you, they have a lot to say and we just need to get it out of them. And, and so when we're thinking about the SEI classroom, so the English, the sheltered English classrooms that we were talking about in the previous question, you know, what, what do you think um, could be addressed in terms of dual language schools versus SEI schools to kind of think about how do we enhance that interaction and that, uh, that engagement that students could have? I, I can start us off if that's okay. Yeah, that'd be great. I think one of the things that I would really like to think about when it comes to dual language schools, and I know this can be a little bit harder for bilingual teachers sometimes to think about or to implement, is that using the entire linguistic repertoire of students in language classes, whether they're in their Spanish time or in their English time, really thinking about the fluid, the fluidity of the languages, I think is so important. And when we separate or we take away the time that students have to interact in both languages together, I really think it's a disservice to our students in dual language programs that although they are learning two languages, I still want to encourage teachers to provide time for those languages to have to be able to be used in a classroom by the student's choice. So true, and that's been found in research on bilingualism that is actually a very high cognitive skill to be able to translanguage or access the words that you need in one language or the other. 
Um, I even think about my own personal experiences and Claude, I don't know if this happens to you, but sometimes I'm speaking and I'm not really sure in which language I'm just speaking and getting my point across. So I hope it's always in English and particularly today, right? <laughs> any of you have anything to add for dual language schools and literacy instruction? Well, I would just say that, um, I mean, I agree with what Christina said. At the same time, I, I think we have to acknowledge that it is more challenging to set up a, a good dual language bilingual education program school. I mean, I'm I'm completely in favor of it. In fact, if if I had my brothers, if I could, you know, wave my magic wand, we would make being becoming bilingual one of the sort of the I mean, just like we assume kids have to become literate and numerate and you know social studies and science. I mean, being bilingual should be part of sort of the basic education that everyone receives for all sorts of reasons, uh, financial, economic, intellectual, cultural, you name it. But it is more challenging. It requires personnel, infrastructure, uh, populations. It requires a number of things that need to be in place. And very often they're not in place or it's literally impossible. You know, we have schools, I'm sure you all know this in Massachusetts, not just in Massachusetts, there are schools with multiple non-English languages. You can't set up multiple bilingual programs. Well, maybe three at the most. And even that is a stretch. But there are schools with, you know, a dozen different languages. So you got to, you know, make some choices. And sometimes it's just simply not practical. Sometimes it's politically impossible to set up dual language schools. So there's lots of barriers there. Um, but if possible to set up dual language schools and, and promote bilingualism rather than bilingual education, being kind of like a uh, compensatory program to use to transition until you know enough English and so forth, which is typically the way it's done. You know, we should use the assets that kids bring of multiple languages and build on those to promote bilingualism for the entire populace. So I, I would be totally in favor of doing that, but don't underestimate the challenge of really doing that well. Yeah, I was very lucky to have my children go through a dual language school in Boston a few years ago. And, you know, they did an incredible job and they are still to this day bilingual and biliterate and probably more biliterate because I came here when I was in third grade and got no more in Spanish instruction. So, um, but they could be so powerful for, uh, for other experiences too, which I think tend to happen more in the dual language uh, schools. And that is that experiential part that you were talking about. Um, I don't dance Latin music, but they used to have dancing ex opportunities, you know, in the school and they had piñatas and they had, you know, kind of like the more traditional kind of yeah. Latin experiences that typically been here for 30 years, I kind of lost that, but yeah. the school gave us that experience back. And I think that's one of the areas of experiential instruction that we don't think it's in the classroom, but that actually adds to, you know, how the students and the families feel engaged. So don't give up. It is hard. It is um, hiring the, the, the teachers, uh, looking for teacher preparation that prepares dual language um, teachers. It's hard because we are, I don't know, uh, very, very, very few programs that provide how to teach Spanish literacy or how to teach yeah. Portuguese literacy. But we do know is that it is much easier to teach Spanish and it is much easier to teach Portuguese, but we don't know about the many other languages, 90 some that are around to be able to do that. So I think it takes a champion in each school to want yeah. to do that. Agreed. We have one last question, um, Claire, we're like at 358, I was supposed to give you back and we ask it. Okay, Dr. Buddy, this one's for you. Uh, it says, Dr. Betty, you mentioned that a teacher can adapt high quality materials to meet the needs of multilingual learners. Can you talk about how educators might be able to analyze cultural materials in an order in, in order to skillfully adapt the materials in the classroom? I thought that was a fabulous question. Yeah. So when you think about analyzing the the cultural materials, what I really like to do is think about, or what I even encourage my pre-service teachers to do is think about what is the ultimate goal? So what is the essential learning in that lesson? What do you want students to learn? What's the non-negotiable? And then really think about what is the language that students are going to need to be able to meet that not that essential learning or that non-negotiable goal. And in order to do that, again, when I referred back to thinking like you could think at the word level, the sentence level, or bigger at the discourse level, and then providing support 
for students at those le at the, the level that they need at that moment. So I really think it's about analyzing the language demands. You kind of have to put on your like language detective hat and look and see what potential challenges might arise for my students with this content based on the experiences that they're already bringing, the languages that they know, what's already been taught, and where I want them to go. Anyone have anything to add? No, I think I, I'm on board with what Christina said. <laughs> Thank you, uh, all of you, for participating today. I'm going to turn it over to Claire. I want to leave everybody with the idea that we can do this uh, and that we could do it well for our students. And, you know, to not forget experiential learning, oral language development, and the power the peers have to teach each other English in a different way that the teacher is. So thank you again, Claire. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rinaldi, for leading this conversation. Um, there were more questions in the Q&A than we could, we, we could elevate, and there were phenomenal questions. So, um, and then several requests for um, the, the, the five um, tenets of instruction that Dr. Goldenberg mentioned early on, the four um, uh, instructional strategies that Dr. Buddy mentioned. So um, I, I hope you don't mind, panelists. I did promise I would reach back out to you all and, and just try to pull it all together so we can make that information available to um, the people who, who registered and attended this webinar. Um, it, it was clear that this really um, was an engaging topic that people want to want to continue to dig into. Um, I just want to express our enormous gratitude uh, to all of our panelists, Dr. Goldenberg, Dr. Buddy, Mandy Hollister, for sharing your time, um, your expertise, and, and your experiences with us today, because that is really what I think is most powerful. Um, and I think it's a conversation that we all agree is going to continue um, as we all collectively work to make sure that teachers have the skills, the knowledge, and the resources they need um, to support the growing, the growing population of multilingual learners here in, in the Commonwealth. So with that, this concludes our three-part webinar series on equity and early literacy. A link to our webpage will be placed in the chat where you'll be able to find links to recordings from all three webinars going forward. Um, and we're just so grateful and appreciative to the interest in this series and um, look forward to continuing this work um, in partnership with, with all of the educators and organizations throughout the state. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Take care. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, nice meeting you all. <laughs> thank you.